Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on Implying Evidence-Based Strategies for Preventing Dropout in Secondary Schools. Before we begin, here are a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are some application widgets you can use. You can expand each widget by clicking on the Maximize icon at the top right by dragging the bottom right corner of the widget panel. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available approximately one day after the webcast using the same audience link. A copy of today's slide deck and other resources are available in the resource list widget, the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for presenters during the webcast, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will try to address as many questions as possible during the webcast. If we run out of time, your question will be answered later by email. We do capture all questions. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon that covers common technical issues. Now I'd like to pass it over to Julie Brew. Julie, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Brew. Um, I'm a researcher at Mathematica Policy Research, and I do a variety of work with the Realm at Atlantic. Um, I was also involved in the development of the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide on Dropout Prevention that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm joined today by Bob Balfin from John Hopkins University School of Education, as well as Dan Kaplan from the International High School. So before we jump into I'm um, talking about dropout prevention, I just want to give you a brief overview on the REL Mid-Atlantic. Um, the REL Mid-Atlantic is one of 10 regional education laboratories across the U.S. They're all funded by IES, the Institute of Education Sciences, which is an independent, nonpartisan entity within the U.S. Department of Education. The purpose of the REL Mid-Atlantic is to work directly with states and districts in Delaware, D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania to help them build their capacity to interpret and use data and research to address educational problems. So each REL's work is driven by the needs of the states and districts in the region, so it's really a bottom-up approach. And we listen to the needs bubbling up through our stakeholders, and we think about how we can help address those needs in ways that increase their capacity to use evidence. So we provide support in one of three ways. The first is through the dissemination of existing research knowledge. Um, so we'll share some of that today. Uh, the second is through training and coaching around the use of data research. And then finally, the third is by conducting research studies that gather new evidence. And then we share out those findings so other agencies across the region and the country that are thinking about similar topics can benefit from that work. So today we're going to be talking about a recent practice guide focused on dropout prevention that was published by the What Works Clearinghouse, or the WWC. We'll start with some background on the WWC and practice guide and we'll provide an overview of the recommended practices for preventing dropout in this practice guide. We'll then provide some details on the steps recommended for implementing each recommendation and provide an example from each recommendation to give you a sense of how these interventions and practices can look on the ground in schools. Um, we're also joined by two practitioners who have experience designing or implementing programs with these recommended practices. So we'll hear from them about their experiences and perspectives as well. So first, I'll present the first two recommendations in the guide, which focus on monitoring and intervening with students. And Bob Balfans from the Everyone Graduate Center will share his experiences with those types of practices for preventing dropout. Then we'll present the third and fourth recommendations, which focus on engaging students in their school experience. Um, helping them manage challenges in school, and also creating small, personalized learning communities. Um, and Dan Kaplan from the Early College High School Program will join us for that discussion. And then we'll conclude with about 20 minutes of Q&A. So I want to begin with a brief overview of the What Works Clearinghouse and its resources, so you know um, what's sort of behind the development of the practice. Over the past few years, there's been a push for education decision makers to make instructional and curriculum choices using evidence from scientifically based research. But identifying evidence-based programs and practices can often be time-consuming and difficult. 
Um, searching for an educational topic might return hundreds of studies, and even if educators have time to find and read all of the relevant research, it can be difficult to identify the high-quality studies that are credible. So the WWC was established in 2002 to be a central and trusted source of scientific evidence for what works in education. The Clearinghouse aims to identify all relevant rigorous research on a topic, review those studies against design standards, and then summarize the findings from high-quality research into free products for you to use. The WWC's goal is to help busy educators efficiently make evidence-based decisions based on the most rigorous research out there. The Clearinghouse doesn't um, directly test or study interventions, but it summarizes the evidence for educators and can support you in finding or accessing evidence and a range of your questions. So practice guides, so WWC practice guides are intended to support educators and administrators in addressing common challenges in their schools and classrooms. So each practice guide provides solutions to a particular problem or to improve achievement on a specific topic or for specific students. Um, the solutions are based on the findings of rigorous studies as well as the wisdom of a panel of experts that includes both researchers and practitioners. Practice guides typically include three to five evidence-based recommendations that can be implemented in a school setting at little or no additional cost. Um, they are designed to be compatible with your school or classroom's existing standards of curricula. So each recommendation is presented as a set of practical action steps that describe how to implement the recommendation, and they're accompanied by many examples. Um, each recommendation also concludes by noting common obstacles for implementing um, and provides the panel's advice about how to overcome those obstacles. So before I dive into the recommendations for how educators can address um, the challenges of dropout prevention, I want to give you some background on the dropout practice guide. So the recommendations in the guide are appropriate for students in grades 6 through 12. And the WWC came up with the recommendations by doing a comprehensive literature search that identified more than 1,800 studies related to dropout prevention. They reviewed those studies to identify the high-quality, rigorous research, and ultimately 25 studies met the design standards and were related to the WWC worked with an expert panel of researchers and practitioners in the field of dropout, including Bob Balfans, who's joining us on this webinar today. Um, to help make sense of this research and draft the recommendations in the guide. So now I'm going to turn it over to Bob to talk a little bit about the themes and recommendations in the guide. Thanks, Julie. So as we worked on this dropout prevention guide on the expert panel, which was a team of both researchers and practitioners, we, we examined the, the studies that were identified as having an evidence base, and then also drew on our experience in the field to help interpret them and figure out what they were telling. And from this work, really three prominent themes emerged. The first is that the evidence really supports the idea of continually monitoring of school level and student level data to identify when and where intervention should be applied to prevent students from falling off track. And this is the idea that students that drop out over a period of time, just, they just don't get frustrated one day and drop out the next day. It builds over time. And during when it's building, they are signaling um, through various uh, uh, means of, of sort of school behaviors that they're sort of falling off track to graduation. And if we monitor these signals, we can identify the kids that are giving them, and that gives us the opportunity to intervene um, and get them back on track. So that's the first big theme. The second theme is that different students require different types of supports uh, to keep them on track and engaged in school. And what that really tells us is that once kids have been signaling or been identified as in need of extra support, it's important to try to think about and pool resources and insights and to talk to the students and figure out why they're signaling, um, because it could be different reasons. It could be academic, it could be social, emotional, it could be in school, it could be out of school. And if we don't, we don't respond to the actual need, then our intervention is not going to work. And then finally, the big learning was is that once a student has an off-track indicator, we either need to sort of change a, a, a solve a problem or change a behavior. And that's really hard to do without a relationship between the adult and the student. And to have these relationships between adults and the students, we often have to change the organization of the school to create a personalized learning environment that enables these relationships to occur 
so we can then leverage them and use them to understand the root causes of why kids aren't coming and then also to help figure out how to change those behaviors or solve those problems. So then um, on the next slide, we, um, there's four recommendations in the practice guide and Julie's gonna take us through them in depth in a minute, but just to give us sort of a foreshadow what's gonna come, the recommendations are to monitor the progress of all students and proactively intervene when they show early signs of attendance, behavior, or academic problems. And this is sort of the ABCs of uh, staying on track to school success. Attendance, behavior, course performance, you need to be able to show up every day, focus in class, get your work done. That's how you're on track to graduate. If in fact you're struggling on one of those, that's a signal that we need to, we need to do something. Um, for a subset of kids that have really high challenges, we have to provide intensive individualized supports to students who have fallen off track and face significant challenges. They're gonna need sort of more intensive and ongoing supports than students that have more moderate um, or more uh, intermediate challenges. Um, recommendation three is really almost a prevention strategy. It's really important to engage students by offering curriculum and programs to connect schoolwork with college and career success and then improve students' capacity to mount, manage challenges in and out of school. Um, trying to get all our kids to graduate high school ready for post-secondary, we've gotta give them all those experiences that build their ability to succeed with that and to manage themselves. And that's sort of a good prevention strategy uh, for dropout prevention. And then finally, when schools have many students uh, with off-track indicators or many high-need students, it's really important the evidence shows to create small personalized communities to facilitate the monitoring and support of those students. If you have hundreds and hundreds of off-track kids, if you don't sort of subdivide them across teams of adults, it just becomes very hard to actually um, do the work. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Julie, who's gonna take us now more in depth um, into these recommendations. Thanks. Um, so as uh, Bob just told you, the first recommendation is really about catching students before they fall off track. Um, so the recommendation is to monitor the progress of all students and proactively intervene when students show early signs of attendance, behavior, or academic problems. And the steps to carry out this recommendation are first, organize and analyze data to identify students who miss school, have behavior problems, or are struggling in their courses. Second, intervene when students show early signs of falling off track. Um, the third step um, is really focused on absenteeism because the panel thought that attendance was a, um, a particularly important challenge to pay attention to. So they recommended that if data show high rates of absenteeism, whether for individual students or groups or a whole school, to take steps to help students, parents, and school staff understand the importance of attending school daily. And then finally, monitor the progress of, um, of this work and adjust the interventions as needed. So the practice guide includes a lot of examples for how to implement these steps, but I did want to talk a little about the sort of initial steps of designing the early warning indicators. Um, so the first step is to identify the early warning indicators that are important to monitor. Um, research has shown that the ABC indicators are important for identifying students who are falling off track. Um, so while issues like pregnancy or homelessness or problems at home might be risk factors, their impact is often captured through the ABC indicators of attendance, behavior, and course grades. Um, so here on this slide, we show some examples of early warning indicators in each of the ABC categories that have been used in districts across the country. The practice guide doesn't prescribe a specific threshold to use for identifying at-risk students but it does recommend that you use historical data to establish a baseline to identify when students deviate from the norm. Each school might have a different level of normal, so it's not possible to prescribe a single threshold for all schools to use to identify um, warning signs. Um, and another consideration is that setting a more stringent threshold will mean that more students get identified as at risk, and some might not actually require intervention. But on the other hand, casting a wide net like this ensures that students that do need support are identified early before the problems get serious. So making the decision of how stringent the threshold should be is in part due to resources. So does your school have the capacity to provide support to larger groups of students, some of whom may not need the support? 
Um, or do you need to focus your resources on the students most at risk of falling off track by using a less stringent threshold, such as 80% attendance rather than 90%? Um, and one of the key parts of the early warning system is also to include indicators that can be updated and monitored on an ongoing basis, not just at the end of a marking period. So this will allow you to identify students when they first start to fall off track rather than waiting for a bigger issue like failing a course. Now, while recommendation one includes school level, small group, or individual supports for students at risk of falling off track, the second recommendation in the guide is intended to serve students who need more individualized support than that offered in recommendation one. So the types of interventions um, recommended in recommendation one include things like academic tutoring for specific students falling behind, um, double dose math class for a targeted group of students, or um, new disciplinary practices to address attendance problems caused by suspensions. But recommendation two is focused on providing intensive individualized support to a targeted group of students, including those who are already off track, um, who have not responded to interventions in recommendation one, or who have to overcome large personal obstacles and are unlikely to graduate with more intense intervention. Um, so the, this second recommendation is to provide this intensive individualized support to students who have fallen off track and face significant challenges to success. And the three steps here are um, first, for each student identified as needing individualized support, assign a single person to be the student's primary advocate. Um, then develop a menu of support options that advocates can use to help students. And then finally, support advocates with ongoing professional learning opportunities and with tools to track their work. So a key part of this um, offering individualized support is assigning a single person to be the student's primary advocate. The advocate is the go-to person for the student in the school. Um, and the guide recommends that advocates provide individualized supports to students who are off track, and they should be prepared to support students in many ways, including academic assistance, uh, behavioral interventions, mentoring, um, addressing basic needs like provision of food or school supplies, um, or things like college planning and preparation, just to mention a few of the, the kinds of um, supports they might offer. But no single package of supports will work for every student. Um, so advocates can use a menu of supports like this to create an individualized plan based on each student's needs. And schools can help guide the work of advocates by creating a menu of supports for them to use to develop a unique plan for each student. So this is a sample menu of supports that a school could use, but schools can customize this based on specific programs or interventions that they want to provide for their students or the types of issues common in their students. And I'm going to hand it back to Bob to talk a little bit about his um, perspectives and experiences with these two recommendations. Thanks, Julie. So we've been working in the field with schools and districts for over a decade to help implement early warning systems. And in that time, we've learned both a number of challenges and some workarounds for them. So I'm just going to share some of the highlights of that experience. One of the first challenges people say is, like, we can't get the data. Like, we, 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 how do we get data on attendance and behavior and course performance? It's all in different systems, and we're frustrated because we can't look at it all together. Um, two things to keep in mind. One is that there's been a lot of improvements over the, just even the last five years with the student information systems, and many now, in fact, do have early warning modules as part of them. They may not be actively used, but they may be available. So it's first important to check, does your student information system actually have an early warning system module which would help organize all this data, the attendance, behavior, course performance, other data, all together to let you look at you know, a student holistically across those domains and multiple students in a class at the same time. The other thing to keep in mind is that at the end of the day, all the data you need is in the school. It's in uh, teacher's grade books. It's in the office referrals. It's in the daily attendance. And so many schools have been able, if nothing else works, using spreadsheets and Google Docs be able to compile that data, you know, on a sort of a class-by-class -class basis so teachers or, and others participate could just look at the data for their kids, the kids they interact with, right? And that's what gets people focused 
and um, engaged in the work. So that's sort of uh, some of the data workarounds. The other challenge people have is like, how do we how do we create a response team to this data? Because it's it's great to have the data, but if we don't act upon it, it doesn't. It's just a pre autopsy. It doesn't really give us anything. Change things. So what people have learned over time is that depending on how many students are signaling, leads to different types of organizing responses in schools. So if it's around 20, 25 kids in the whole school, then probably an existing student support team could be repurposed or restructured or sort of the, the student support specialists, the counselors, the social workers, uh, an administrator could take the lead and then bring teachers in as needed. But as soon as it starts to get to 50, 60, 70, or 80, 100 students, you really have to create teams of adults that look at kids they have common experiences with and sort of divide up those groups of kids so it's not overwhelming. Um, and the vision here, if you think about the big change, is that historically we, these, these student needs are pushed off to a, a specialist who might end up having a caseload of hundreds of kids, a counselor or a social worker, um, and they can only then actually help a small number of those kids. What the early warning response teams are trying to do is groups of adults that come together with smaller, more manageable number of kids, they can actually pool their insights about that kid because each adult knows a different piece of the puzzle. So you have to create structures and time in the day or after school for those groups of adults with common kids to come together and share, monitor the data, and then share their perspective, think what the best intervention can be, assign a champion to follow up to make sure it gets implemented. Another key thing that we've learned over time is people are like, there's just too many kids. We just spent the whole meeting talking about one kid because it was such a complex problem. And there we've learned over time it's really important to build protocols and have roles on the team. Someone who like gets the data and helps decide which group of kids to look at first and emails it to people ahead of time. Someone who's the timekeeper that says we're only going to spend five to seven minutes per student to get our first best guess of what to do and then try it and move on. Someone else is going to make sure let's record what we do so we can go back and check and learn later on did this intervention work. And oftentimes people don't take that step to record what they do which really makes it hard to come back later and say, how many times did we try that? Did it actually work? Because that's the process by which really strong local knowledge, which you can learn at the school level, what's the right intervention for the right kid in the right circumstance at the right time? It's by keeping track of what you've done and seeing what works. So someone has to have that role. And then the final thing we've learned is that, again, to avoid this sort of like overwhelmingness of it, like too many kids, too many indicators, what, are we, what can we do? is to really be thinking about what is the most strategic level to intervene. And sometimes that is at the individual level. That's where you have to give the supports. But sometimes there's groups of kids with similar issues you could solve at a group level. Or sometimes the data might tell you the issue is, is centered in a classroom. So a classic example is you might see a spike of kids failing science and think, wow, it's going to be a challenge to find science tutors in the middle of the year for 10 kids. But if you look a little more at layer up the data, you might see that all those kids are coming from a single classroom. And it might be much more effective and powerful to help provide that teacher support than providing tutors for the individual kids. So that's the power of reminding yourself to always look up a level, see if there's a more strategic point to intervene before you go to the kid level intervention. And then on recommendation two, the sort of more intensive supports, what we've really learned there is whether you're having case managers or student advocates, or um, social workers or, or any kind of folks that are taking, you know, intensive case-managed support of a smaller number of kids, it's really important to find ways to integrate them into the fiber of the school and not have them be sort of they're off by the side, needy kids go there, hope they figure it out, but really have a way for those people to feel that are doing that work to feel part of the school, integrated in with its sort of plans and progress, and also have a way to share information back with those early warning response teams, the school leadership teams, about some of the key challenges and trends they're learning. Because often they're a good early, early indicator of severe problems. Maybe a bunch of their kids are having a new transportation issue that, we can, that can be solved at a higher, you know, more group or, you know, principal-led level. Or maybe it tells us that there's a new problem with, with, with housing evictions, and there's got to work with a partner to sort of find a way to sort of help prevent kids from having the, you know, to mediate the bad effects of that. So it's very important that when you have folks in the building doing intensive case management, that they're not just off of the side, they're part of a larger effort, and there's a good two-way communication flow with them. And with that, I'll um, turn it back to Julie.
to take us through recommendations three and four. Thanks. Um, so recommendation three is focused on engaging students in school. Um, and student engagement improves course pass rates and it helps students feel a sense of belonging in school. Um, so the guide recommends that schools engage students by offering curricula and programs that connect school work with college and career success, and that improves students' capacity to manage challenges in and out of school. And so the three steps recommended to carry this out are first, um, directly connect schoolwork to students' options after high school. Second, provide curricula and programs that help students build supportive relationships and teach students how to manage challenges. And third, regularly assess student engagement to identify areas for improvement and target interventions to students who are not meaningfully engaged. So students can become disengaged from school for many reasons, including failing to see why school matters, uh, believing that they're not capable of succeeding in school, um, feeling that school is a hostile, unsafe place. Um, so the examples in the practice guide span from social-emotional learning to vocational learning because there's so many different approaches for engaging students in school. Um, on the screen here, I'm just showing you one example from the guide about how to use experiential learning throughout the high school experience to engage students. Um, so this approach helps connect students' school experiences to their career or post-secondary interests, and the learning opportunities build upon each other over time. So you can see here the, the example is that um, there's a health careers academy. So in ninth grade, students start to build awareness. Um, employees from a local hospital may come to discuss their professions at a career day. Um, the following year, they explore their options. So they complete a spring break job shadowing at a local hospital. They can learn about different medical careers. In 11th grade, they start to develop relevant knowledge and skills in the health area. Um, they can take a medical clinical class that combines instruction and clinical skills with a twice-weekly internship at a local hospital. And then finally, in 12th grade, these students would gain hands-on experience, and they could do a summer internship in the medical field. Um, so engaging students um, can't be accomplished, though, with a single initiative like this, like implementing experiential learning opportunities. Um, the guide recommends that schools regularly assess student engagement to make sure that the initiatives they're taking are working and to identify specific students that um, need additional outreach. Um, there's various ways to do that. Um, there's several free school climate and student engagement tools and surveys that might be useful for this purpose. Um, and you can select one that's not only valid and reliable, but also aligned with what the school community feels is important for student engagement. Um, these tools can be implemented annually or more frequently if there's um, concerns about engagement. And the practice guide points you to um, a few of these free tools that you could use for monitoring and uh, assessing the student engagement practices. Now the fourth recommendation in the guide is um, for schools that have many at-risk students um, to create small personalized communities to facilitate monitoring and support. And the guide focuses on creating small communities because it's a practice that can be implemented by individual schools, but the recommendation can also be implemented at the district level by creating small schools. Um, so the steps to implement this recommendation are first, um, decide whether the small communities will serve a single grade or multiple grades. Second, create teams of teachers that share common groups of students. Third, identify a theme to help build a strong sense of identity and community and to improve student engagement. And finally, develop a schedule that provides common planning time and ample opportunities for staff to monitor and support students. So as you can see, the first step is to decide how to structure the small community within the school, which is a really fundamental question. Um, it depends on the local context and the needs of the students. So for example, if the patterns in the school data suggest that students begin struggling in transition years, like sixth or ninth grades, um, you could consider creating single grade transition year academies. Um, these kinds of transition year academies serve all students in a specific grade, and they focus on the particular needs experienced by students as they start middle school or high school and adjust to the new demands and expectations. 
Um, other schools might find that their data indicate worsening trends as students enter higher grade levels. So those schools could form college or career-focused communities that include students at multiple grade levels. And schools can also choose to create smaller communities that span all grades to allow students develop, to develop strong peer relationships that begin when they enter school and last through graduation. So there's a lot of options there, and it depends on your own um, goals and needs within your school. So the expert panel viewed recommendation four as a way to facilitate the implementation of the other three recommendations in schools that had high dropout rates. Um, so you can see a couple um, examples here of how it ties into the other three recommendations that we've talked about. Um, so for example, creating teacher teams that share groups of students can make it easier to implement recommendation one, which is, um, involves sharing information among teachers and monitoring students falling off track. And it can also make it easier to um, implement recommendation three because it helps build those supportive relationships um, between students and between students and staff. Another key step of this recommendation is to identify a theme, which could be an academic topic or a career topic. And this helps engage students in school and see connections between school and their futures, which also recommend, um, relates to recommendation three. So you can see a lot of connections here about how these small communities help facilitate those other practices we have talked about. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dan Kaplan um, to talk about some of his experiences with these types of practices. Thanks a lot. Um, just a brief background about me and our school. Um, the full name of our school is International High School at LaGuardia Community College. We're in Queens, New York. Um, we're a public school and LaGuardia is a public college. Um, I've been at the school since 1994 and have evolved from a history, social science, humanities teacher to a guidance counselor to the assistant principal for guidance and now I'm the director of our early college program, which I'm going to talk about. Um, our school was created in 1985. It has 500 students. 100% of our students are ELL. They're, um, it's an ELL population. The two requirements to get into our school is that a student has to be in the country less than four years. And what we like to not really joke about, but since we don't like tests at our school, is that they basically have to fail an English test to get into our school, which obviously is what designates them as ESL students. Um, we have 40 languages within our school. We're a Title I school, so all our students get free lunch. Um, I would say it's hard to always gauge, but about 20 to 25 percent of our students are undocumented. Um, and many come from their native countries with very poor numeracy and literacy skills in their native language and certainly speak very little English. We're not a bilingual program per se. Our program is a hybrid. English is taught through the study of content in the classroom, but we encourage and incorporate native language use to master curriculum, and we encourage and want them to further develop their native languages. And I mean, the graduation rate for ESL students nationally, and certainly in New York, is pretty bad. I don't have the current statistics right in front of me, but when the school was created in 1985, the graduation rate for ESL students was about 30%. At our school, pretty much since the beginning, the graduation rate has been 90%, if not higher. Um, recommendations three and four sort of interrelate. I mean, you'll, some, place, some answers I would give could go into either, so, but the first part will be more of a response to uh, recommendation three. I mean, part of a, a huge way that we engage our students is that we're an early college program. And what, so we're fully, our school is fully integrated with LaGuardia Community College. We're on campus. There's the power of location, so our students are constantly interacting with a college population. Um, we have full collaboration between departments and administration, as well as funding. And students can take, no, no student must take a college class. It is certainly encouraged. But most of our students start taking college classes as early as their second semester of ninth grade. And another wonderful thing about our program is that we have a five-year program. So if, if a student completes all their graduation credits by um, requirements by the end of 12th grade, they can stay for a fifth year as a full-time college student, but as part of our high school. And so they're still getting the support. It's free of charge. And so throughout this process, and I teach what I like, 10 advisory classes a week, which is to support students that are in college classes from the 10th graders to the students in the fifth year. So they're really learning and developing real college skills while they're in high school. Um, I would say a large majority of our students graduate from our school with 25 to 30 college credits. 
We have some that have actually graduated with uh, also an associate's degree after the fourth or fifth year. That's not common, but it's happened. Um, we also have an internship program. It used to be school-wide, but because of a variety of reasons, scheduling and funding, we, we can't do it for every student, but we have a internship program that's for 11th and 12th graders that students opt into and can choose to take part in. Um, another part of our program is that within, if you walk into a classroom, what you'll see is that students sit in circles, they're not in rows. Um, it's almost all project-based learning where the students are learning from each other, what we call collaborative learning. Uh, teachers develop their own curriculum and a lot of it reacts to what student needs and interests are, even though obviously there's a lot of teacher input. Um, we have 70 minute periods, so the typical high school has 42 minutes. Um, since the beginning, we've had long periods, seeing that as a way to really get to work in depth. Um, and if, another thing you would notice if you walked through into our building, that there are no bells, there are no hall passes, teachers are called by their first name, and those are all Small things by themselves, or, but all together there's this culture of trust that students understand that we trust them until they give us a reason not to trust them. And when we do all our surveys at the end of the year, I mean, safety and trust and support are a huge part of what students say about our school. Many students don't want to leave at the end of the day, whether they're in after-school activities or not, they just want to hang out. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more um, with recommendation four, but we also have a team-based approach. We have teams, which I'll talk about later. Um, but we have a counselors on each team, and each team has a small group of students. And part of our philosophy has always been that you work with all your students, but you really want to target the 20% that are struggling the most. And one of our former principles, which I've, a lot of us agree with, is that you're really as good as the work you do with the, those students that are struggling, that are disaffected. And since we have a team structure, we, those teams, sometimes with administrative support, sometimes by themselves, can develop team interventions. Um, we also have a lot of outside support, not just from the college, but we have a mental health clinic that now is on campus that students can get counseling from if they or their families want counseling. Um, so that's another huge component of support where we engage students and are constantly interacting with our students. Um, I think at this point you can go to the next slide, which would more answer, question, um, talk about recommendation four. So the way our school is structured is we have two institutes, a junior institute and a senior institute. Um, the junior institute is three teams of ninth and 10th graders, so students stay together for two years. And each of those three teams have 75 students approximately, four teachers and a counselor. And so they get to know each other very well. Um, so it's like a small school with smaller communities within an already small school, um, and the ninth and 10th grades combined. Same thing with senior institute, it's 11th and 12th graders combined with of, they're slightly bigger, about 125 students, so they have five or six teachers and a counselor. And through this, I mean, we've found over the many years that this fosters engagement. You have incredible knowledge of students. There's connections between students and teachers. Everybody knows everybody. Teachers can talk about students they have in common. And so there's constant conversation about teaching and learning and about kids. Um, another aspect of Recommendation four is just the, our curriculum that we, the teams develop them and share them together. Um, so we, do, we have a variance from state testing. Um, so kids do not, there's, all, there's one test they need to pass, which is an English test, a New York State English test to graduate, but the rest is through portfolio, which is sort of like assessment drives curriculum. So the fact that we do project-based learning, they're working on projects that become part of a dissertation-like portfolio that they present. They present one at the end of 10th grade, and they present one at the end of 12th grade. Uh, so, and one thing is we, you'll see all students are constantly talking with each other. They're often making presentations of the, in front of the class. So there's a constant effort to work on all the modes of communication that they're working on listening, reading, writing, speaking, and they're active learning. Active learning. And there's a, a very strong belief that students learn from each other. Um, in terms of our schedule, we have since the beginning um, three out teams, each of these five teams, have three hours of meeting and planning time built into the regular day schedule. So it's Tuesday mornings and Wednesday afternoons. And if you walked into any of those meetings, you'd see curriculum planning, interdisciplinary planning, sharing what's happening in each class. You can make connections um, to class. A teacher comes in with an issue with their class, with a student. They're supporting each other. A lot of case management, they're going over um, the students that they're having issues with, and maybe something's working in one class where it's not working. 
the team is really the center of the school. Um, and that's where interventions are planned. And certainly, if they need help from administration or outside their team, they can get that. Um, and the other thing that I think students notice, which engages them but also makes them feel like they're part of a community, is that we as teachers mirror exactly what the students do. We ask students to work on teams and with groups of students. Teachers work on teams. We ask them to work collaboratively. We do. Um, teachers, as part of our evaluation, also we developed our own we were approved by the state, the New York State Department of Education, but developed and present our own portfolios as part of evaluation system. And the, the key parts of those evaluations are our self-evaluation and other teachers. Um, so that's all part of the evaluation process. Um, one other thing I would add before I finish is another thing that I think is key is uh, some people see as a very key sign of student engagement and students feeling supported and empowered is how many adults they connect with within their high school. And when we do our surveys at the end of the year, um, people say it's great if a student connects with one adult. I would say the average student in our school would say that they connect with three or four adults, that there's, these are people that they feel um, supported by, mentored by, and that they can go with with questions, concerns. Um, and I guess one thing I didn't mention is part of that portfolio process when they're academically is that each student is given an individual mentor, and a mentor works with a smaller handful of students that helps them develop the portfolios towards in 10th grade and in 12th grade. Um, so at this point, I will pass it back over to Julia, who's going to moderate the questions and answers. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the other presenters for a very interesting uh, discussion so far. So we are now starting the Q&A portion of the webinar. I just wanted to remind everyone to please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions about how to um, submit uh, a question or um, about how the webinar um, software works, you can also submit a question to our tech folks. So the first question we will ask to Bob. And that question is, if there is one recommendation in the Dropout Prevention Practice Guide that you would recommend starting with, which would it be? Um, the first one, the idea of setting up a way to monitor all kids' progress and reacting to it when they're signaling they're, they're off track. Um, one thing we've learned is that, especially in high-poverty environments, even kids that have done well in prior years, things change and they can be thrown off track. So in one big study we did that involved 11 big school districts and multiple middle schools, we found that fully a quarter of the kids that had been proficient at the end of elementary school in math and English, um, you know, in sixth grade, either became chronically absent, got in trouble, or failed math and English, even though they were proficient, which just points to the view that, like, we just got to keep our eye on all kids and then react to them uh, when they signal. Great. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have a question for Julie. What is the supporting evidence for each of the recommendations in the Dropout Prevention Practice Guide? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the way that the, um, the What Works Clearinghouse um, uh, assesses evidence is that it looks at all of the, the rigorous evidence that's identified and meets um, standards, and then um, looks at which studies um, show positive effects on students. Um, and so, and, and then it classifies it, um, the recommendations as having um, strong, moderate, or minimal evidence. Um, but I do want to say that even minimal evidence um, doesn't mean that the, the recommendation hasn't shown that it will work. It just means that there aren't a lot of um, really strong links strong causal links between the practice and educational outcomes. Um, but it does include um, promising practices that the panel believes will be effective. Um, so I'll say that the first recommendation um, is supported by um, two studies that found um, positive outcomes. So this was um, assigned a minimal level of evidence. Um, recommendation two, which um, is about um, uh, providing individualized supports to students, um, that is supported by um, four studies that um, met our rigorous standards and um, showed positive effects on student outcomes. Um, so that's considered to have a moderate level of evidence. 
Um, the, the final recommendation, recommendation four about um, small personalized learning communities is also assigned a moderate level of evidence um, with uh, um, seven studies that, um, that showed positive effects on students. Um, however, some of those were um, tested personalized learning communities combined with some other practice. Um, so it's hard to say that it was specifically the personalized learning communities that led to those improved student outcomes. So that's why that recommendation has a moderate level rather than a strong level of evidence. Um, and then recommendation three, um, which is about engaging students in school, that has a strong level of evidence. So that has the, the most number of studies um, supporting it, meeting rigorous standards, and showing positive effects. Um, so for that recommendation, there are nine studies that found positive effects um, on student outcomes, and um, a good number of those did show um, the, that that practice in isolation was um, linked to positive student outcomes. So there's a strong causal link there. And Julie, just a quick follow-up question to that. Can you dig into the idea of low or minimal level of evidence a little bit more? Uh, does a low or minimal level of evidence mean that educators should ignore that practice or um, not implement it? No, definitely not. Um, there's, um, it just means that there's less rigorous research that's been conducted that shows positive effects on student outcomes that clearly links that individual practice to improvements in student outcomes. Um, but for a recommendation like recommendation one, which is really about monitoring students and providing these broad group or school level supports, that may be because it's just a, it's a difficult intervention to study in a, in a rigorous way, like a, a randomized control trial. It doesn't mean that researchers have, have studied it rigorously and it hasn't shown positive effects. It just means that the, the supporting research isn't out there for us to say that there's a strong causal link. But the panel believes that all of these um, recommendations will lead to improvements in student outcomes, and all of them are supported by um, at least two studies that do show positive outcomes. Great, thank you. Another question for Bob. Are there any data from research to indicate, given a choice, it would be better to Im embed recommendation three in a regular high school or house them in a separate location? Recommendation three in a regular high school or just trying to understand it. Because <laughs> recommendation three is sure. about, like, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, just for the, the audience, too, a reminder. So recommendation three, engage students by offering curricula and programs that connect schoolwork with college and career success, and then improve students' capacity to manage challenges in and out of school. Um, and so I think the, the question was focused on whether it would be better to implement um, that recommendation in a regular high school or um, in a, a different setting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is a, the number, th that recommendation was in, ma in many ways, as I said, is seen as almost a preventative recommendation. That we know if students understand the relevance of what they're doing, if they know that they see that there's a reason for what they're doing, that it leads to an, an outcome they value, and if they're given some skills on how to sort of manage challenges, that they're more likely to, to not develop off-track indicators, for example. So I see it very much as sort of a set of generalizable practices that that regular high school should be using and not just for sort of, and, and or that you don't need to create a specialized high school to do it. Yeah, and I, um, I'm glad we have this um, handy Q&A technology. The um, person who asked the question submitted some clarification and they were referring to the school within a school concept. Oh, I see. Uh, in case that, that helps um, okay. yeah. if so you want to expand in a way that, on your thoughts. Yeah, in a way that's combining recommendation three and four, right? It's creating sort of that school within a school to create a more personalized environment and then having the content be the more relevant and engaging work and then also the sort of skill building. So that's, that's a similar idea that if you, have, if you have a very large school, you may have to break it up into schools within schools to be able to carry out some of this more uh, focused and um, 
personalized work. Great, thank you. Um, we have several questions for Dan. Mm -hmm. So first, um, is the internship at LaGuardia High School basically a work-based learning program? Are the internship experiences in the community at various employment sites or on-site at the school? Uh, the, the short answer is all of the above. I mean, some of them are more work-based. We have students that go on internships at hospitals, dentist offices, law offices. We have others that are more community service-based. Students are really interested as they are immigrants and in getting involved with working on immigration issues. So they may work at a, a really good group in New York City called Make the Road, which works on advocacy. Actually, so some, that's work-related and that some of them end up getting jobs through their internships. But some are more like about a community service space than others are work-related. So it's both. Most are off-campus. We have some students based on their individual needs, their family situation, whatever, that we try, we can set up internships across the street at the college or in the high school. But most we try to place out in the community. Great. And a follow-up question. Um, yeah. Are there English language learners who are also classified as students with disabilities in your high school? Yes. Um, at this point, there's a small number. Um, yeah, and we have a special ed teacher, and we have students with 504 accommodations. So yes, we do. Um, tricky thing with recent immigrants is that they often don't come with any, any, anything from their native countries that designates any learning issue or you know, um, disability. So when we have a kid that's struggling learning, the thing that's very hard with recent immigrants is that you for, first have the well-documented like sort of immigration shock that often in the first year they can barely function just because it, it, everything is so new emotionally. And then sometimes if they're not performing well, besides the emotional component, it's hard to know how much of it is liter literacy-based in terms of their understanding of their own native language and their ability to communicate or is it a learning disability? So it's often, a, over time, it's a process of trying to figure out and separate all these issues and figure out what's going on. But the short, we do have a small group of students with designated learning disabilities, yes. Thank you. Sure. Um, that's a, a nice segue into our next question. Um, it was first mentioned that numerous studies were used in generating the results presented in this practice guide. Do these studies incorporate students with disabilities, students in special education, or just students enrolled in general education courses? Um, and I think we will direct this question to Julie. Thanks, Julia. Um, so our search um, did not distinguish what types of populations we are looking for. Um, but in practice, the studies that um, were used to support the practices in the guide, so the studies that were um, rigorous and met the design standards of the WWC, um, were generally included general education students um, or in inclusive classrooms, but they weren't focused on um, students with disabilities or special ed. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Dan. How did you decide to structure the institutes by 9th slash 10th grades and 11th slash 12th grades? Do you see an advantage over um, an additional or a different type of grouping, like a 9th to 12th grade grouping? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've actually gone through several incarnations. I mean, at one point, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders were all combined in one classroom. I mean, we had the team structure. We had small teams and small groups of students on each team. And actually, that had its advantages and disadvantages. Um, about 15, 12, 15 years ago, we got a variance from state testing and moved to project to portfolio assessment. And so students, when they, it, it fits very well, first of all, in terms of getting to know small groups of kids very well. And when a teacher knows a student and a student knows his teachers, his or her teachers for two years, I mean, there's a, a deeper connection. Um, and it allows, um, it also, we have, since we have a 10th grade portfolio and a 12th, it allows you two years to develop projects and work on the development of the skills the student needs to present and pass those portfolios and then move on to the other institute. So it fit in with our assessment structure. It fit in with our philosophy of getting to know kids. Like if you change every year, you change every semester, you're, you, know, you know kids for a very short period of time. So I think it's the philosophy of getting to know kids well, as well as fitting into our curriculum and assessment structure. Great, thanks. Um, another question for Dan. 
what sure. suggestions would you have to avoid the quote-unquote warehousing, uh, whether that's real or perceived, of at-risk students in the small learning communities model? Um, I don't usually use that word very much. It's interesting. Um, I mean, I don't think avoid warehousing. Um, I mean, I think we put so much focus on supporting the kids who are struggling for whatever reason they're struggling that um, any stigmatizing or, you know, I think there's always, good, I mean, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I think we do a good job of, of reaching out and, and trying as many different interventions and mentoring as we can with kids who are at risk. I mean, in a lot of ways, when you talk about an ESL student, they're, as a group, they're a huge at-risk population, and that's certainly how they've been considered given their low graduation rates. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, you know, it's just treating all kids and working with all kids at all different levels. Um, I feel like there isn't that perceived process in our school, so I think it's just the way the culture of the school and how you work and with kids who have all different learning styles and learning abilities. I don't know how well that answered the question, but. Um. No, thank you. And um, for the user who submitted the question, feel free to um, submit additional follow-up if um, yeah, absolutely. can provide absolutely. For clarification. Um, the next question is for Bob. What recommendations can the panel offer in terms of how to best share these recommendations with comprehensive support and improvement schools before next year? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I think the, that a lot of work and effort was put into built, making the practice guide itself be educator friendly. So I would first recommend just, just actually checking out the guide if you haven't had a chance yet to see the work that was put into it, to, to put it in a way that was communicatable to educators, um, both by the, the, the areas that give sort of, so it tries very hard to put a lot of like the hard statistics and things like that in the appendix and really come up with very clear recommendations and then give lots of examples from practice on how to solve implementation challenges. So I guess my first recommendation would be to see, to check out the guide itself and see how that could be communicated and share with those schools. Great, thanks. And I'll also put in a plug for um, the practice guide summary that was developed for the practice guide. Um, if you don't necessarily have time to dig into the full guide, you can check out the summary, which is um, a shorter, sort of at-a-glance version of each of the recommendations, as well as um, just a quick summary of the supporting research behind each recommendation. Uh, sort of a related question for Julie. Um, are there any plans to develop PLC facilitator guides and participant handbooks for this practice guide? Uh, this, this attendee notes that they have seen and are using these resources for other practice guides, and they think they're excellent resources for schools. Okay. Um, yeah, there there aren't any um, of those facilitator guides or participant handbooks in the works right now, but the RELs always um, happy and interested to hear what stakeholders think would be interesting and useful. So that's that's really helpful to hear, and um, we can always follow up later to to learn some more about what kinds of guides you'd be looking for. And um, you'll see on our um, on the slide here, we do provide a few email addresses, so if, if you do have resources that you're interested in seeing, I think we would encourage you to, to reach out to one of the presenters listed. Uh, the next question I think uh, will be great for both Bob and Dan. Um, perhaps we will start with Bob. And the question is, can the presenters talk about the recommendation of assigning a single advocate to individual students? Does that mean that in a school of 400 students, there should be 400 advocates? Or can an advocate have more than one student? If so, what's the right ratio? So Bob, do you want to take that so, one first? Sure. So yes, the, the, the advocates, depending on how they're organized, can, can certainly have more than one student if, they are, if that is sort of their primary job. There's some other models where teachers become what are called success mentors. And they may only be, have one or two students, but then you have a much greater uh, a pool of people to spread kids across. 
But the idea is, is that these are not necessarily for every kid in the school, though at some level it's true in a high-need school every kid could benefit from it. But it's part of the idea of that after you've done a good progress monitoring and, and sort of more targeted and whole group interventions and some good preventions, that there's still going to be a subset of kids, particularly those that have pretty high out-of-school reasons why they're, they're struggling in school, um, they're going to need this case management approach. So the thought would be that of that 400 in a high needs environment, maybe it's 100, <laughs> maybe 150 that need that case management, and that then that could be a combination of more full-time advocates that could have five or ten, um, or it could be spread out among a greater pool of adults that have two or three. Thanks. And Dan, did you want to weigh in as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, our model works where, like, within a team that you sort of have to prioritize. Some teams have, if you have a five professionals on your team and 75 students, some teams, the teach team does it differently, but some may actually divide them into groups of 15 and say, in terms of providing some kind of advocacy and support for all the kids on your team, that those are the kids they sort of follow up on and make check in with in addition to when they see them in class or in the hallways. Um, and then you sort of prioritize as you see kids with higher needs. I mean, I, that's happened to me as I I'm not a counselor on a team, but I run the early college program that sometimes, especially if there's young men that could use um, specific guidance, like one-on-one -on -one mentoring, that I will, I will end up meeting with them once a week for an hour, almost like a counseling session. So I think you sort of, the whole mentoring process, almost everybody has to mentor more than one, just given our limited resources. But certainly certain kids, you sort of have to prioritize and put more energies in the kids that you feel like need, you know, the more very direct advocacy and support. Yeah, and just expanding on this discussion, we had a follow-up question come in. Uh, for one attendee, they mentioned that in their district, they have nearly 10,000 students. Each guidance counselor has about 300 to 400 students assigned to them. How can they afford to be an advocate for these students? Um, how would you suggest they navigate this challenge? And again, if um, both Dan and Bob want to weigh in, I think that would be great. Sure, I'll start. I mean, I can, so, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, so that, that, that's the really idea of, of this idea of needing to create teams of adults, teachers and others that, that know and understand and share their kids because you can't, it, in large numbers, you can't have a person with unmanageable caseloads trying to do it all themselves. That's where you have to adopt more of the team approach so a group of adults can work with a group of kids they know well and then sort of spread those, spread those needs and supports out amongst themselves. And I think... One of the things we've, a model we've tried to incorporate in our school, and not everybody feels comfortable with this, is that it's, it's something like we're all teacher counselors, and obviously we are a small school, and our ratio is better than that in terms of, I mean, those are ridiculous, you know, crazy numbers in terms of providing support for kids if you have a caseload of 400, but that if you, if you feel comfortable, and that doesn't mean you have to deal with every crisis that happens, but that if, every, if you can get all the professionals in the building to take on the fact that we all have to support kids both in the classroom and outside, some, that I think that builds, it, it creates a great culture, but it also can take that, it doesn't have to be the guidance counselor that's supporting that teacher. It can be through a team or it can be a teacher that, you know, I mean, that happened with my own son in school where he just connected with a teacher and that teacher sort of mentored him. And so I think the teachers who are willing and can be trained and supported in doing that, that adds a lot more adults that can provide that support to kids. Great, thank you. Um, another question I think would be great to have both Dan, uh, Bob and Dan weigh in on. Do you have a recommendation on how to help students who don't come to school? It's hard to help students and keep them from dropping out when they're not in school in the first place to be helped. So do you have any suggestions or can you point to any um, strategies from the practice guide? Yeah, so this is Bob. I'll start. That, that, um, so a couple things we know is that and this is the idea of where we talked about the of you know building personal relationships with students, so you can really get to the root cause of why they're not coming. So we know broadly from the work on chronic absenteeism that there's you know three big buckets of why kids don't come. There's something keeping them out out of school that's happening in their in their lives outside of school: child care, elder care, working to pay the electric bill, having to go to court, all kinds of things like that. There's another group of kids that are avoiding something at school, being teased, being bullied, um, 
didn't get their homework done and don't want to be yelled at because they didn't get their homework done. And it goes from very serious to very sort of minor issues, but enough to keep the kids from not coming. And then the third set of kids are just disengaged and don't see the point. They think they can get by four days a week is enough in their complicated lives. And so it's important that somebody who knows the kid can really understand the reasons because if you, if you if you just guess and you get it wrong, you could make it even worse if, you, if your intervention doesn't match to the reason. So it's first undercovering the reason and then building responses to that reason. Um, that's sort of the first step at, like, unpacking that attendance challenge. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the, the situation. If you, you have to find out what's going on, and we have lots of interventions and support services we can provide to families. If it's a family issue or if it's a health issue, we have lots of families with health issues. Um, if there's an issue, I mean, we're often very aware of the tensions and issues that are going on in school because we know the kids so well. So if there's a situation at school, I mean, so it's sort of like you have to get to the bottom of it and, and then gauge your interventions based on um, – you know, what, what the situation is and why it's happening. I mean, in my school, you know, you've got kids who are afraid of coming to school because of they're, they're afraid that ICE is going to come and deport them. I mean, so that's like that's an outside thing. There's not much, you know, it's a scary world out there for immigrants. So, I mean, you've got lots of reasons that kids have developed new fears about coming to school, even though they feel safe in our school, you know, they're worried. So, I mean, again, it's identifying the cause and then finding the appropriate intervention. Great, thank you. Um, for our next question, uh, I'm going to sort of interpret this uh, the, the way that I think the question is being asked, and we will direct this to Bob. So for researchers or evaluators who are looking at dropout prevention programs, are there practices or strategies or outcomes that are not currently recommended through the What Works Clearinghouse in this practice guide? Um, but that you think show promise and may need more evidence behind them? Hmm. <laughs> it's a really good question. I'm trying to think, like, yeah, what do we what, what do we look at that we didn't quite think there was enough evidence to support, but was promising? I mean, I think a little bit of the of the work in social emotional development is there. I mean, I think we felt confident about the sort of self management uh, skills and, and body of knowledge, which sort of fell under our recommendation three about helping kids develop their ability to deal with challenges in and outside of school. But there are some, you know, increasingly uh, growing body of work around social emotional development and its importance for success in and out of school. And there wasn't really enough body of evidence to go beyond the rec what we did as far as sort of the self-management skills. So that, that's the first one that comes to mind. Sure. Um, and we had a few questions um, around the process for developing the practice guide, so I think we'll direct these to Julie. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about who was par a part of the expert panel for the dropout prevention practice guide? Yeah, sure. So in addition to Bob, who you're now familiar with, um, we had two um, sort of practitioners on the guide. So we had um, Sandy Addis, who's the director of the National Dropout Prevention Center and Network, so he had really sort of a, a big national bird's eye view. And then we also had Deborah Duardo, who's the superintendent of the Los Angeles County Office of Education, who had much more of a um, on the ground practitioner's point of view of sort of what was what had worked in her schools and what they were trying and um and what she thought was effective. Um we also had three researchers. So the chair of our panel was um Russell Rumberger, who um is a, a professor emeritus at the um University of California, Santa Barbara. We had Elaine Allensworth, who is at the University of Chicago Consortium School um, uh, Consortium on School Research. Um, and we also had Mark Donarski, um, who is at Pemberton Research and who had also led um, the previous dropout prevention guide done by the What Works Clearinghouse, which was um, put out about 10 years ago. So they had a, a big range of um, experience and had sort of a, a mix of practitioner and, and, and research um, expertise. And then a follow-up question, Julie. Do practice guide recommendations come only from academic research? No, that, that's a good question. So um, as I explained, we, um, we do our um, literature search and identify rigorous studies, but a lot of it is really um, 
taking that expertise of the panelists that have real world, world experience um, to figure out what are the specific implementation steps behind each recommendation and what are the examples that would be most useful to educators and practitioners. And also they play a big role in the, um, the obstacles sections of the practice guide. So there's a bunch of sort of practical obstacles that um, educators might face in implementing the recommendations. And the panelists provide a lot of their real world experience there to come up with solutions and approaches to, um, to those obstacles. Great, thanks. Our next question is for Dan. How do we balance the credit deficiency and creating programs that will engage students, such as career and technical education programs, early on that usually require a certain number of credits in order to attend? How do we sort of balance those two um, perhaps competing priorities? Um, well, I guess we try to, you know, get the students to, you know, move towards graduation as best we can. But we've, we're, we're lucky enough, even though I never feel like there are enough programs to, there's a part of the Department of Education, there's a cooperative, ed, uh, co-op tech it's called. And so some students as early as 10th and 11th grade can spend a half a day in our school, but then Take, go to a program that's either hairstyling or carpentry or plumbing. Um, and we've had more and more students engage in those programs and you know, get licensed. I mean, again, that's an issue for undocumented students because often they, get, they can take the training, but they can't get licensed without a Social Security number. So there's always those issues. The other thing that we've developed over the last few years is that, I mean, so LaGuardia has, through its adult and continuation, continuing education programs, offered us programs, especially for our school, but also the kids can plug into programs that need, that they can get into sooner, like just being a phlebotomist and being different programs that we've had students do either instead of, but usually in addition to what they're doing in our school. So I guess we're trying to do both, trying to move them if we can towards graduation while at the same time providing something that feels like realistic to them because they may not be academically motivated or certainly not be thinking about college. So. Um, so the, you can always use more. There's never enough of those seats and enough of those programs, but I think we try to, that way we try to balance the two of having them do some of both. And another question for Dan. Yeah. Uh, the attendee mentioned that it sounds like you were saying that conducting a root cause analysis to tackle why students are not coming to school is um, you know, a key to what you were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. Is there one or two types of root cause analyses, um, tools or resources that you can point to? I mean, the place to start is with the kid. And obviously, you know, I feel like we, does that, I mean, obviously you have to start and talk to them about what's going on. And obviously if they're not there, you can't ask them that question. So you can go to their house, you can call them on the phone. Um, but starting with the kid, even if they come in once a week, like what's, you know, sitting down with them and taking the time and then hopefully developing, which I think in general we do well, a trusting relationship where the kid's going to open up about what's happening and to the extent that they feel comfortable. You know, is it, is there abuse going on at home? Is there, you know, their stepfather this, whatever, or, or something's happening at school. So that's where you start. I think then at some point you want you reach out to the family and try to bring the whole family in or talk to the family about what their sense of what's happening is. I mean, but kids are often incredibly honest. I mean, you know, you've got kids who, you know, part of it is that they're drawn. So I think you start with the kid and then move to the family. And then if you can find interventions to support, you know, you have to, you can only give the kid what they're willing to take. You can offer counseling, you can offer this, but they have, you know, they have to, there has to be some kind of buy-in. Um, but if a kid says, you know, you have a sense that they're a member of the Latin King gang, you know, that's not, you may know that that's the reason and that's pulling them away. So where's, you know, that's a deeper issue about what's causing that and how do you, how do you intervene to, to put them back on a different track and, you know, you, you do the best you can. But those would be my tools. A pretty, you know, just go to the source of what's going on. Sure, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. And while we still have everyone on the line, I just wanted to remind everyone to com please, com please complete our survey at the end of the webinar. And for our last question, um, I'd love for all three presenters to weigh in on this. Um, first, perhaps we can start with Bob, then go to Julie, and then wrap up with Dan. 
So the question is, how can I use this practice guide in my district, school, or classroom? Um, and I, I think it would especially be um, interesting to hear your different perspectives um, and what ideas you might have uh, if you were in uh, the role of educator or administrator. Um, how would you use this practice guide? So we'll start with Bob. I mean, I guess it, it would just, I would use it, it just reinforces that there are some very, like, um, things you can do that make a real difference, right, from setting up a system where you can monitor all kids on their, on the, sort of those core, core early warning indicators, have a process for those kids that need more intensive support, do some upfront prevention by working on the sort of engagement and self-management skills, and then recognizing that depending on the size of the need in the building, you may have to reorganize the school itself to make those other three recommendations possible. So I think that the, the key thing is that the, although this synthesized a lot of different studies in a lot of different areas, it kind of came down to a couple of three or four strong actions that sort of all work together in a system. And that's the other thing I would say is recognize that, yes, each of these individual recommendations can work by themselves, but at some level, they also work best as a system. So think about how, what would it take to put those components in place where in the fourth component where needed um, to get the reinforcing power of doing of doing all recommendations together. Thanks, Bob. Julie, did you want to weigh in next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think Bob is right that there's a lot of sort of big picture thinking that can be done, especially at the school or the district level, um, about how to implement sort of the, the package of recommendations in the practice guide. Um, but as a, a teacher or you know, a principal or any school staff, there's actually a lot of um, examples within the guide that can be lifted and implemented tomorrow. You know, so I, I think that you, you could use it at both levels, that you could do some big thinking, some um, professional development around it, some perhaps restructuring of your school or, you know, enhancement of your data systems or things like that. But there's also things like there's um, an example of a fridge sticker that you can um, give to students and parents to highlight the importance of daily attendance and the impact on grades. Or there's um, small greetings that teachers can use when students enter the classroom to make them feel engaged and like they belong and somebody cares about them. Um, so there's a lot of those sort of small things that I think are important to um, that that can sort of be implemented right now and that can be um, taken right out of the guide. So I think it can be used at both levels. Great, thanks. And Dan, any thoughts on how you might use? A resource like this practice guide in your role. Um, I mean, we've we've you know tried to implement a lot of you know a lot of the things we do are come straight you know the recommendations match with what we're doing. I think I think school change is really hard and I think incredibly overwhelming because it feels like there's so. I mean, I, I think you're right. I think we have to start with like what's one thing I can do now? What are two things we can do now? Because if you try to say we're gonna, I mean, I think some of it has so much of it has to do with the culture of the school. And things, steps you can take to change or move the culture of a school. And to me, that always has been, I mean, I've worked for a couple of years before I came to this school. I worked at a school where I felt totally disempowered as a teacher. And my students felt incredibly disempowered. I don't think it was because I was disempowered. It happened to be with the whole culture of the school. And, and then I came to a school where teachers, I mean, teachers have to, are, are the ones that are sitting with those kids most of the day. And... Teachers need to be empowered, and whether that, in terms of whether it has to do with creating relevant curriculum, not feeling that they have some control over what they're doing, their pedagogy, that it's not rote, that it's not, that there's, they're allowed to be creative, and that, that doesn't exist in a lot of school districts. And I think if you empower teachers, that creates an atmosphere that empowers students and starts to create a culture where teachers and students feel connected, that we're in this together. And it's not that everybody's an active learner. The teachers are active learners. And the teachers, it's not like teaching is not giving information. So how do you structure a classroom so that you're not just an inter information delivery system and a passive learner is feeling disempowered because they're just – so, I mean – I think, what, can you make the classrooms a little bit longer? Can you start, break your school into teams? You know, you, every change takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work. So I think it's really picking something that you feel like 
where can you start this process? Or can a group of teachers start a little model like a, a, a like a little pilot program of some student teachers that are more willing to take a chance and do it. That's how our school started it. One group of six teachers started a team and then others followed when they saw how successful it was. So anyway, I think you as a school have to look at where you can start and how you can model some, some different practices that engage students better. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, everyone. This concludes our webinar. We'd like to thank everyone for attending. And again, please remember to complete our survey, which will help us bring you additional webinars like this one in the future. So thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.